Jeff Shreves. Jeff, it is so good to see you. I am terribly bummed that I missed you uh, when I was in, in London, but great to see you now. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I know you had a good weekend. Well, let's put it this way. You had a lot better day at Wembley on Sunday than your poor husband Ian did at the Emirates on a Saturday night, didn't they? Oh, my Newcastle goodness. Newcastle fans. Was, yeah. no, well, that would have been a quiet dinner on Saturday night, I'm sure. It, it but, was. Uh, great day. <laughs> <laughs> but you got over the line experience. eventually. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did. Exactly. Uh, yeah, the Sunday definitely made up for it, Jeff. That's for certain. <laughs> um, all right, let's chat on this Manchester derby. Uh, the consensus here at the desk is that uh, United really uh, don't have much of a chance in this one. I'm very curious to get your thoughts on this matchup. Yeah, you would have thought so. You think of their, their problems of late, although their form isn't bad. One seven out of the last nine. Uh, huge defensive problems. They've got Hoyland missing as well. And they just don't seem right, do they? I mean, I know I'm like a broken record. Every time I come on here, I say, I'm just not convinced by Manchester United. And I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not convinced by them. However, it's a derby and we know anything can happen in a derby. Manchester United have taken more points than other Premier League side at the Etihad. Won four. Won four games there. So they've got a puncher's chance. You never know. But it, it's the style, isn't it? Because the way that Manchester United play, it's very much on the counter-attack. They're hoping to spring a surprise on City. And I just think that City can handle it. No problem whatsoever. They're so used to teams playing like that against them. A low block and then triggering a lightning transition. I, I can't see it happening, but I just think you'd be wrong to say it's an impossibility because mm -hmm. you never, ever know. And it could be, it could be a result for United that kickstarts their season. But, you know, look at look at last season, 6-3 hat-tricks for Foden and for Haaland. They absolutely battered them. And to be honest with you, it could have been more. So United fans, I think, will go there full of hope, but also a certain amount of fear as well, a certain amount of dread. Jeff, I think we all agree at this desk, if they have any chance of uh, winning, it's going to be on that counter or any chance really in this game. And that's going to have to come from one Marcus Rashford, who recently released an article on Players Tribune, sort of responding back to his critics and the media a little bit. You're there. You know the media landscape in England. How is this being portrayed? And do you think this is adding more pressure to Marcus Rashford's pretty rough season? Or do you think this is starting to relieve it? Well, there's no question, is there, Alexis? He's not having a great season, but you'd have to say neither is anybody at Manchester United. There's very few players right now. OK, Hoyland of late, but didn't have a great start. Harry Maguire out injured, but after a rocky start, he's doing well once again. There's nobody, there is nobody in that Manchester United squad right now absolutely covering themselves with glory. You get a few coming in every now and again doing OK. As for the article that he um, he put out on the Players' Tribune, personally, I found it, I actually found it almost a little bit sad because he's clearly stung by the criticism. And I think you have to be quite analytical when you look at it. And having spoken to a few people today, I think what's hurt him the most and is the only reason he's responded he feels that some are questioning his commitment to the club. Now, you have to be quite specific. Separate his commitment during games. OK, he's not talking about his performances. He's not pretending that they are good right now. And I think perhaps this is where it's become conflated between the media and Rashford. He talks about how when he was a youngster, the effort that he made to sign for the club, he could have signed for other clubs. He was offered last summer. He could have gone to another club. He chose to re-sign for Manchester United. He absolutely loves Manchester United. He, he really does. And I think that is what, if you like, has prompted him or stung him into action. As for his performances right now, and he's been criticised, uh, and his body language, I think that is what has been questioned, the effort that has been put into games by Rashford himself. He is playing out of position, which doesn't help him. But still, you've got to always give maximum effort he just it, to me personally for what i don't know what the reason is maybe it's everywhere across the pitch he just doesn't look quite right he doesn't look happy and as we all know that's a you know a consequence of poor results nobody's happy in that team right now but i think what he's saying is okay fine you can criticize me i've done things wrong i'll admit those but don't do not for one second question my commitment to this club this is the club i love this is the club where i grew up this is my club response to it from the media 
in some sections of the media not particularly impressed by it they think it sounds like a, an excuse if you like it looks like they are it looks like marcus rashford in their eyes is saying you know this is not acceptable this criticism I, i'm not entirely sure that rashford's response was to the actual media itself it may well have been because you know we've got a, a plethora now of social media sites huge amount of fan clubs as well I, I, I think it's not necessarily the mainstream media that has concerned him. So whatever way you look at it, he and the team are not particularly looking like they're in a good place right now. I think it hurts extra for Marcus Rashford because he's united through mm -hmm. and through and so much that he's done for the community, an absolute legend on the humanitarian front. That's one thing. And the football side of things. If you're if you're the leader of Manchester United and you're not scoring goals and United is has been poor throughout the season, of course you're going to get questioned. And you're the guy who yep. is expected to score goals. And and if you compound the poor body language, which is probably not only him, it's the entire team. Like like, of, of course this is going to be the scrutiny Marcus Rashford is going to get. But the commitment, I, I understand the commitment is is that that's that's almost a, a given for. Marcus Rashford, I get that, but it should, Nico, it should it should be it's a given for any player, right? And what I think has prompted this, what has been questioned, is his actual work ethic in the games, and that is what has brought about this situation. Now, me personally, any player on the pitch, they're entitled to be commented upon, whether they work hard or they don't work hard, or are perceived to have worked hard. Are they tracking back? Are they closing players down? my mind, that's all fair game. Now, if somebody isn't at the top of their game, there's normally a reason behind it. And I don't think he's pretending for one second he's absolutely on it right now. I don't think so. But what he is saying is, hang on, do not doubt my feelings for this club whatsoever. But at the same time, you know, his body language, uh, I know one of the commentators said, you know, look, look, He's got to do more. He's got to bust the gut. He's got to be working a lot, lot harder here. You can't just be throwing your arms up in the air. And that's been said about Fernandes as well in frustration. That's not good body language. So it may well be that because he's hurting right now, he's perhaps more vulnerable to those comments. Don't know. But once again, as we always say, you imagine if they win at the Etihad on Sunday and Rashford gets the winner okay. or certainly plays a part in it, all this changes. Everything in football is results driven. When you are winning games, really, you can pretty much do what you like. Yep. When you're not winning games, everything comes under scrutiny. And that's what this all boils down to. Jeff, I agree with you that every player is fair game in terms of being critical of their performance. But I think, at least for my perception, this kind of seemed like the culmination of many rounds of people kind of going after Rashford. This isn't the first time he's become sort of this focal point for United, whether or not it's him solely underperforming or not performing at all among his fellow teammates who also have poor performances. Um, so I do have a bit of empathy for him. But mm. do you think that sort of this amount of undue criticism that befalls him is because he's sort of this talisman of United, or if it's just sort of a lot of excess vitriol from the internet? Uh, I think it might be a bit of both, Christine. Don't forget, he, you know, he's a huge star. He's a huge star. He's an England player as well, in England. So that focuses the attention as well. The fact that he's a striker as well, that means you get more attention than you do maybe as a, a left back or a right back, you, you're definitely going to get more attention. But don't forget, Harry Maguire had this earlier in the season. But I think what Marcus Rashford's point is in the article, OK, let's say, although he doesn't talk about Harry Maguire, Maguire was criticised for his play, for the way he plays and what he does. Rashford said, I get criticised for my car, my jewellery, for my tattoos. It's just relentless. It is just relentless. Now, there are many, many media outlets who don't mention any of those things whatsoever, and they talk about purely his playing. So I, I agree with you to an extent that he is highlighted, but that is because he's one of the biggest stars. And also for what he did in the pandemic, the, the incredible efforts he made to help feed hungry children 
which he was awarded an honour for, that brought him even more to the nation's attention as well. And it, it, it's sad that something that he did that was so positive could elevate his profile so high, whereby he becomes so relevant. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult situation in many ways, but I go back to what I'm saying is that it's because of his status, it's because of where he is, and also because he's not playing well right now, in my opinion, for whatever reason. But it's like Rude Hullet used to say. He always used to say, the tallest trees attract the most wind. Hmm. That's interesting. Jeff, I do want to ask you a question that's not Marcus Rashford related. Um, look, I think owners and front office staff in England, in particular the Premier League, their words are very carefully thought out. And then there's John Texter, uh, who <laughs> I think shoots from the hip, not to use an American idiom. But he recently said that he feels the financial rules, the PSR and the, the FFP, uh, are really built specifically to help uh, to keep the lower teams from being able to spend. Because even if you have a billion dollars in a wheelbarrow, which, by the way, weighs 10 tons, that's a big wheelbarrow, uh, even if you have that money, you can't spend it because of the amount of revenue that you bring in. If it's not enough, you can't spend what you have. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you think shooting from the hip, so to speak, or speaking so openly and positive. How do you think that's perceived in England? Well, first of all, I wouldn't want to be his gardener if that's the size of his wheelbarrows. <laughs> that's number one. Hey, if it's uh, got a billion I, dollars, I'll be his gardener right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think he raised a good point, to be honest with you, Alexis. He said, you know, financial fair play is a fraud term when it comes to this, if it's about sustainability. See, he just does not buy it whatsoever. He's not, you know, and he talked about uh, the Nottingham Forest. I mean, he said, look, John Textor said he's got partners, hasn't he? Um, who's his other partner in Crystal Palace? Josh Harris, billionaire. He owns basketball and football teams in America. He's got fortunes he could put in Crystal Palace. He can't. He's not allowed to because of the rules, which seems crazy. And most of these rules were, were brought in to safeguard two things from happening. One clubs overstretching themselves and therefore going bankrupt and fans and communities losing their clubs, which is, of course, what we don't want. And secondly, to stop bigger clubs or certain clubs, if you like, to get around profit and sustainability rules, massaging the figures about the sponsorship, doing deals within their own group as well, basically coming up with numbers whereby they could spend and spend and spend. OK, you get both of those examples. But here, what John Textor is saying is, look, i got cash, cash, cash money, right? Here is the dollar. Here are the greenbacks. I want to spend it now, OK? There'll be no loans, no comeback on me. I want to put money in, and I can't. And he's frustrated. I, I think he makes a really, really good point. I think the rules do need looking at, and I think his comments, which have been widely reported in a lot of places, have been seen as a breath of fresh air and something to think about. I believe there's another meeting in March where this may well be discussed once again. So I think he was looking to highlight this issue so there'll be more attention on it when they meet once again later in the year.